Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, very happy to welcome Tegan Phillips of the History and Philosophy of Physics podcast. And she's going to be talking today about uh, four lesser known women from scientific history. I hope you enjoy okay. her talk. Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I have some slides. Uh, so just bear with me one second as I get this set up. Uh, can you uh, see the slides and can you hear me speaking as well? Um, if someone would just mind uh, putting in a little quick comment. I can. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. I think... Uh, because I'm going to be looking at my PowerPoint, I don't know if I'll be able to see any comments as they go in. Uh, so I will have time for questions at the end, um, but feel free to throw any comments or questions into the various feeds, but just please don't expect me to answer right away, uh, just so that you know. Uh, all right. Uh, as... Uh, like I said, I'm, my name is Tegan Phillips. I'm the host of the History and Philosophy of Physics podcast, and I am going to be talking about four lesser known women from scientific history. So I'm going to start off with a bit more about me. I'm really fairly new to the podcasting world, so I don't expect most of you to have heard of me or know anything about me. Uh, so I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, I was born and raised in British Columbia in Canada, and I started my post-secondary by studying history at Okanagan College, and then I decided to transfer into physics, and I transferred to UBC in Vancouver, where I just graduated, um, I officially, I guess, this month. The graduation ceremony uh, got postponed to this month. And I wound up with a Bachelor of Science majoring in physics and minoring in philosophy. And shortly after my exams finished, I think about two weeks after, I started up my podcast, um, which is on the history and philosophy of physics, which I know is a shocking choice of topic given my educational background. But nevertheless, that is what I chose to do. Uh, so I've been doing that for the last couple of months, and uh, you also may have noticed on the title slide, I'm the founder and president of the UBC Young Women for STEM, which is an outreach club that it, it works to bring awareness to and reduce the gender gap in STEM fields. So I am very interested in the stories of women in STEM, both today and throughout history, and fortunate to be able to share some of these stories through presentations like this one. So this is basically my qualifications and my interest in presenting this talk in particular. Now, there are some female scientists that I'm sure we can all name. Marie Curie, Rosalind Franklin, Dame Jane Goodall, and there are some others that most people will have heard of, such as Diane Fossey and Birote Galdacas, the other trimates along with Jane Goodall, Vera Rubin, Barbara McClintock, and Emmy Noether. But there have been thousands, no, more like millions of women who have studied and worked in various STEM fields throughout history. In this talk, I'm going to take a look at four who are uh, less well-known. So I'm going to talk about Hypatia of Alexandria, St. Hildegard of Bingen, Ada Lovelace, and Tu Yu Yu. I'll speak about their lives, their work, and the impact they have left on STEM and on the world. First is Hypatia of Alexandria. She is actually the first female mathematician who we have decent knowledge of. Hypatia lived from circa 355 to 415 and was an astronomer, mathematician, and Neoplatonist philosopher. Her father, Theon of Alexandria, was also an astronomer, mathematician, and philosopher, and he drove his daughter's education. Theon is best known for editing and preserving Euclid's elements. 
and Hypatia continued his work preserving Greek treatises on mathematics and astronomy. She wrote commentaries on Apollonius's conics and Diphantus's arithmetic, and she compiled an astronomical table. She may also have edited some of the surviving text of Ptolemy's Almagest. She likely wrote more, but unfortunately, complete copies of any of her works have been lost. Uh, but Hypatia is also known to have built instruments like astrolabes, which measure the positioning of celestial bodies, and hydrometers, which measure the relative density of liquids. In addition, she taught philosophy and astronomy at the Neoplatonic School in Alexandria, which was one of the most famous philosophical institutions in the Greco-Roman world at the time. She was renowned as a great teacher and a wise counselor and taught both Christians and pagans. As a Neoplatonist, she herself was considered a pagan. This mixing, mixing of religions and philosophies actually made this a very turbulent time in Alexandria, which I'll speak more on in a minute. Hapisha would drape herself in a tribon, a robe worn by male philosophers, and wander through Alexandria giving public lectures. She has been described as being exceedingly beautiful, fair of form, and having an almost regal air about her. She spoke articulately and logically and was well respected throughout the city. It's believed that one of the reasons why she was able to be so successful academically in such a male dominated culture is that her philosophical beliefs led her to live a life of chastity. Chastity was actually a great virtue among the ancient Greeks, so she was highly respected because of this. One of her pupils at the school, Synesius of Cyrene, who became a bishop of Ptolemaeus, described Hypatia as a person so renowned, her reputation seemed literally incredible. Now, I mentioned earlier that Hypatia lived in Alexandria during a turbulent time. This was still the early days of Christianity, and the religion was growing quickly, making life different for pagans or people of other religions. Hypatia had been protected by the bishop Theophilus, but he died in the year 412, and after a violent power struggle, his nephew Cyril took over the bishopric. It is thought that Bishop Cyril targeted Hypatia because she had so much political influence as a teacher and counselor. A mob of Parabalani, a Christian brotherhood similar to monks who were controlled directly by the bishop, kidnapped Hypatia, uh, dragged her through the streets, tortured her, killed her, and ultimately dismembered her. It is believed that Cyril himself gave the order to attack Hypatia, but this isn't known for sure. Coincidentally, today is actually St. Cyril of Alexandria's feast day in the Catholic Church. Uh, because it's the 1,576th anniversary of his death, which occurred back in the year 444. St. Cyril is, was a great theologian, and he's known in the church for clarifying and for defending Catholic doctrines, and that's why he is honored uh, as a saint, not because of what he did to Hypatia, or may, may or may not have done, because it's not known for sure. But returning to her story... The Christian mob uh, tried to make an example of her by killing her so violently, but it ultimately served to immortalize her as a woman unafraid to stand by her beliefs, religious, philosophical, and intellectual, even unto death. Now we'll jump forward to the medieval period and take a look at the life of St. Hildegard of Bingen. St. Hildegard is a doctor of the Catholic Church. She was recognized in 2012 which makes her one of 36 people and one of only four women to hold that title. As a fun fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria is actually also a doctor of the church, again for his theological works. St. Hildegard is considered to be the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. She was born the youngest of 10 children to a noble family in Mainz. Her parents gave her to the church when she was eight. She was educated at the Benedictine cloister of Dizibodenberg and became a nun there when she was 18. She became the prioress in the year 1136 at the age of 38. St. Hildegard is known for her prophetic visions, her musical compositions, more of her chant compositions survived than of any other medieval composer, and her dramatic works, 
She actually wrote the first morality play and opera, Ordo Virtutum. St. Hildegard also wrote two treatises on medicine and on natural history, Physica and Cause et Curae. They are practical guides to nature and healing. These treatises were almost certainly the first of their kind written by a woman in Europe. Most of the writers at that time were men, but it was typically women who worked as healers. They also show high quality scientific observations, which were kind of rare in the Middle Ages. Physica describes the scientific and medical properties of various plants, stones, and animals, while Cause et Curie examines the human body, its connections with the natural world, the causes and cures of various diseases, as well as human sexuality, psychology, and physiology. Hildegard's books describe various medical practices, like bloodletting, and remedies for various ailments and injuries, such as burns, fractures, dislocations, and cuts. Though St. Hildegard was a mystic, she didn't claim that her written works originated in her visions and possessed their divine authority, but rather from her experience in the monastery's herbal garden and infirmary, as well as her readings of scientific theory. As I mentioned, these works are historically very significant because these areas of medieval medicine were not well documented. Most practitioners were women who rarely wrote in Latin and would not have written practical or theoretical books. So St. Hildegard's works are key to understanding how medicine was actually practiced during this period. St. Hildegard emphasized the green health of the natural world and the holistic health of the human person related through viriditas or greening power. She believed that the plants and elements of the garden were direct counterparts to the humors and elements of the human body, whose imbalance led to illness and disease. Hippocrates' theory of humors was the predominant theory of medicine and illness throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, and her work was based on that. Monastic medicine, or Klosterheilkunde in German, is regaining recognition today, and its practices are becoming more popular. For example, during my research, I came across a website called Healthy Hildegard, which promotes monastic medicine. St. Hildegard's focus on basic nutrition, moderation, and connection with nature are also emphasized in many modern approaches to health. So if anyone tries to tell you that medieval medicine is all irrelevant today, you can direct them towards Hildegard. St. Hildegard influenced the famous psychologist Carl Jung. She embraced a new life and spiritual path when middle-aged, beginning to record her visions and her other writings in her early 40s. And Carl Jung referenced her in his work on the individuation process. When St. Hildegard was canonized and made a doctor of the church in 2012, Pope Benedict XVI called her perennially relevant, an authentic teacher of theology and a profound natural scholar a profound scholar of natural science and music. Now we'll jump forward again to the 19th century. The next woman I'd like to talk about is probably the well, most well-known of the four, but she has an interesting story and has had a great influence on STEM, so she's worth learning a little bit more about. Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, was born as Augusta Ada Byron in 1815 the only legitimate child of the famous poet George Gordon, Lord Byron. Her mother, Anne Isabel Milbank, loved mathematics and the sciences, and Lord Byron called her the Princess of Parallelograms. However, Ada's parents had a turbulent marriage and separated when Ada was only one month old. She never met her father, who left England shortly after the separation and died in Greece when Ada was eight. She was raised by her mother, who insisted that Ada receive a rigorous education in science, math, languages, and the humanities, as well as music and sewing. Anne wanted to keep Ada away from poetry, afraid of her pursuing her father's interests and inheriting his volatility. She believed that insanity ran in his family and that poetic pursuits exacerbated it. As a result, Ada spent many hours studying with private tutors during her childhood. She also conducted her own studies, writing about flyology when she was 12, looking at materials that could make wings, and thinking of ways to create steam-powered flying machines. 
When Ada was 17, she met the mathematician Charles Babbage, who is now called the father of computers. Babbage showed Ada and her mother a small-scale model of his difference engine, a hand-cranked brass machine which raised numbers to the second and third powers and extracted the root of a quadratic equation. This seemed to have sparked Ada's interest in mathematics, and Babbage would become an important mentor and friend to her. Ada was also encouraged to pursue mathematics by Mary Somerville, a well-known science writer, mathematician, and astronomer. At 19, Ada would meet the other important man in her life, William, Lord King, who was a friend of Mary Somerville's son and became Ada's husband. In 1838, a few years after they were married, William became an earl and Ada became the Countess of Lovelace. They had three children, and after managing their household for a few years, Ada decided to return to studying mathematics. William was very supportive and encouraged her in her studies. Ada's next teacher was Augustus de Morgan, a friend of Charles Babbage and first professor of mathematics at University College London, who taught her calculus. These studies gave Ada much more confidence. Ada had had a difficult relationship with her mother, who had been absent a lot during Ada's childhood, pursuing cures for various health problems. She was probably a hypochondriac, and who frequently announced she would die imminently, and who was very critical of Ada throughout her life. In 1841, after Ada had resumed her mathematical studies, she wrote this in a letter to her mother. The combination she is speaking of is her mathematical and scientific skills, along with the imagination and poetic spirit her mother had tried to suppress. In 1842, Ada translated a paper on the analytical engine, a theoretical machine Charles Babbage had been working on since 1833. The analytical engine was the first conceptualized computer and is why Charles Babbage is called the father of computers. And it could do many different operations unlike his difference engine, which was limited to only a few, making it the first explicit example we have of universal computation. Its computational steps could be controlled with punched cards, a simple machine code. The paper she translated had been written in French by an Italian mathematician and engineer, Luigi Menabrea, who had heard Babbage lecturing about it in Turin. Ada also added extensive notes tripling the length of the original paper, taking Babbage's engineering and making it more abstract and metaphysical. She described how operations would work with operation cards, punched cards which defined which operations will be done, as well as variable cards, which were punch cards defining the locations of variables. And she described cycles and cycles of cycles of operations, which are now called loops and nested loops in computer science and which reduced the number of cards or number of steps required to do a, complete a computation. Her example reduced 330 cards to only three. Throughout her writing, Ada corresponded often with Babbage, working with him to debug her computations of Bernoulli numbers and her code, as it would now be called. In 1843, her translation was published, signed AAL. Ada and her husband, William, were very excited. She sent reprints to her mother, and he gave out copies to his friends. After this first translation, she immediately wanted to write more, and perhaps to pursue a career in science writing similar to Mary Somerville's. She had a lot of promise, and Charles Babbage described her as enchantress of number, and the physicist and chemist Michael Faraday called her the rising star of science. Unfortunately, Ada had some difficulties. She couldn't access the Royal Society's library in London because she was a woman, limiting the materials she could work with. And she had some health problems. Ada had had periods of illness since childhood. Also, Ada and William ran into some financial difficulties, due partly to William's elaborate and expensive construction projects. Added to this were Ada's difficult mother and her three children who were approaching adolescence, which is not an easy time for most parents. On top of all this, in 1852, Ada was diagnosed with cancer. It was probably cervical cancer, 
and she died on November 27, 1852, at the age of only 36. While her life was tragically cut short, Ada's work has had a lasting legacy. In 1950, Alan Turing read her notes and coined the term Lady Lovelace's Objection. The most famous part of her writings is actually her computation of Bernoulli numbers through an algorithm she, decide to, she designed to be input into the analytical engine, which is technically the first published computer program and is what gives her the title of the world's first computer programmer. Up until a few years ago, we were basically still using her algorithm to calculate Bernoulli numbers. Ada had many interesting ideas, for example, that the analytical engine could be used not just to solve mathematical problems, but also to compose music. Ada was described as smart and sophisticated, with a clear, logical mind and the ability to bring a more abstract way of thinking to mathematics and science. She called her approach poetical science, uniting skills from both her parents. Her passion and vision have made her an inspiration for women in STEM, and we now celebrate Ada Lovelace Day on the second Tuesday of October, an international day commemorating the achievements of women in STEM. Ada's story also really illustrates the importance of encouraging girls and women in their studies. It's unlikely that she would have achieved all that she did in her short life had it not been for the support of her husband, William, and her friend, Charles Babbage. Now, the final woman I would like to speak about today is Tu Yu Yu. Tu Yu Yu is a modern figure. She is still alive, is 89, and lives in China. But her main work was done before I was born, so that makes it history to me. Tu Yu Yu was born in 1930 in Ningbo, Zhejiang province in China. She is a pharmaceutical chemist whose research has saved millions of lives in South China, Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. And she is the first Chinese woman to win a Nobel Prize. Her interest in medical research started in high school when she had tuberculosis, tuberculosis and had to take a break from schooling to recover. Tu Yu Yu studied pharmacy at the Peking University in Beijing, graduating in 1955. She was then chosen to join the China Academy of Traditional Chinese Medical Sciences, where she studied traditional Chinese medicine for two and a half years and became a researcher. At the time, communist China was undergoing the Cultural Revolution, and it was a dangerous place to be a scientist. Many research programs were halted, and scientists were sometimes imprisoned, executed, or punished in re-education camps. Tu Yu Yu's husband was a metallurgical engineer, and he was detained by government officials and sent to work on the countryside as a laborer. In 1967, the chairman Mao Zedong decided that some scientific programs were required because there was an urgent need to find a cure for malaria. This was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and many Chinese soldiers died of malaria after being bitten by infected mosquitoes while fighting in the jungles of northern Vietnam. A secret research unit was formed called Project 523, with the aim of finding a cure for the disease. In 1967, over 240,000 different compounds had been tested by researchers around the world trying to find a cure, but none had been successful. Tu Yu Yu was a member of Project 523 and was appointed the head of it in early 1969. Because her husband was working the land in the countryside, Tu Yu Yu had to leave their young daughters at a local nursery in Beijing to travel to the island of Hainan in southern China to study the disease. In addition to studying the victims of malaria, the research team looked through ancient Chinese medical texts to try and find historical treatments. They found a text which referenced the use of sweet wormwood, Qing Hao in Chinese, to treat malaria around 400 CE. Experimenting on this herb, Tu Yu Yu and her team discovered the compound artemisinin, Qing Hao Su, in 1972, which inhibits plasmodium, the malaria-causing parasites in the blood. Their first extracts actually weren't effective, but Tu Yu Yu carefully reread the ancient text and changed the preparation method slightly in light of it. 
the compound needed to be extracted at low temperatures, not allowing it to reach its boiling point. The extract now seemed to work when it was tested on mice and monkeys. Tu Yuyu volunteered to be the first human recipient of the drug, saying later to Chinese media that as the head of the research group she had the responsibility. She didn't experience any ill effects, so they moved on to clinical trials conducted with Chinese laborers suffering from malaria. The extract would quickly lower fevers and decrease the levels of plasmodium, the malaria parasites. Initially, her team couldn't publish their findings due to governmental restrictions on the publication of scientific information, but it was published anonymously in 1977, and it finally reached international audiences in 1981, when Tu Yuyu presented the findings at a meeting of the World Health Organization. In the early 2000s, the World Health Organization recommended the use of artemisinin-based combination drug therapies as the first-line treatment for malaria, and it is still the primary way of combating the disease. She became the first Chinese person to receive the Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award when she was granted it in 2011 for her work on the discovery of artemisinin, and in 2015 she received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Tu Yuyu is the first Chinese person to receive the Nobel for Physiology or Medicine, and the first Chinese woman to receive any Nobel Prize. In China, she is called the Professor of Three No's because she has no graduate degree, has never studied or researched abroad, and is not a member of any Chinese national academies, such as the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Tu Yuyu is often described as being driven and passionate, and Fu Mingliao, a colleague who worked with her for over 40 years, described her as a tough and stubborn woman. But her persistence truly paid off and artemisinin-based drugs have saved millions of lives around the world. From ancient Greece to the modern day, there have always been women in STEM, though many of their names are now lost to history. Those we know of illustrate the impact women can have through life-saving discoveries like Tu Yuyu's, world-changing inventions like Ada Lovelace's computer algorithm, to the observations and recordings done by women like St. Hildegard of Bingen, and the courage of women like Hypatia, who took on what were regarded as male professions. They all have fascinating stories, showing us the importance of pursuing your interests, standing up for your beliefs, and supporting young people interested in STEM. These historical women have paved the way for young women like me to study and work in STEM fields, and for that I am incredibly grateful. I hope that you enjoyed this talk. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the history of science, or at least of a science, then please check out my podcast. Thank you all for listening. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tegan. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I hope you're ready for a couple of questions. Um, uh, do please ask any more questions. We've only got about 10 minutes or so, but um, if anyone else has got any questions, uh, please chip in. Um, we've got one from um, Matt Grace, who says, are there any resources you would recommend to help educate young girls and boys, presumably, uh, on these things? Um, I don't know if I have anything in specific, not that comes to mind. Um, I know there's there a, a lot, lot of, sorry? For the, for the Ada Lovelace Day, isn't there quite a lot? Yeah, there is. Um, so that's a great thing to start just looking that up um, and following. I know they have a lot of different resources available um, and have links to, uh, I think there's the whole page for the organization um, that's set it up. Um, and there's various different organizations that celebrate it. Um, so that's a great place to start. And there's a lot of um, various outreach organizations that have different materials. Um, there's organizations uh, specifically like targeting, uh, trying to aim at in increasing the number of girls and women in different STEM fields. Um, and usually there's like national organizations um, that are working towards that. And they have a lot of, um, like uh, websites with a bunch of different resources for activities or uh, links to research that have uh, more information about whether there's uh, specific educational practices that have been shown to be 
more effective at engaging girls uh, at various different levels. I know there's a lot of research being done at the sort of like middle school, high school, elementary school level um, among school children for how to engage more girls and get them to continue on to take the sciences in high school uh, or pursue things like engineering. Uh, there's a lot of research being done nowadays. And so gradually people are coming out with recommendations. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have anything specific off the top of my head, but starting just looking out if there's anything uh, within your country or within other countries um, that are specific organizations that have banks of resources, whether you're looking for activities or looking for research to kind of guide lessons or um, that kind of thing. Um, Rob suggested a book that uh, yeah, I've come across it called uh, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Um, and Matt wanted to clarify that he has two daughters, which is why he was asking about educating girls, I think. Um, I had a question as well, actually. Um, do you think it's fair to say that we would have been better off if we had followed Hildegard's herbal cures rather than pursuing male-led medical theories? And wasn't it sort of until the late 19th century that doctors, men mostly, uh, actually cured more than they killed? Um... <laughs> I think it, in some ways, uh, yes. I think you have to have a mix. Like modern medicine has a, a good mix with um, different ways to treat different uh, diseases. And um, not everything can be cured by herbal rem remedies or by um, spending more time out of doors or taking things in moderation. It is, it's, a lot, a much healthier lifestyle to follow a lot of these recommendations. Um, but obviously, like something like cancer um, isn't very easy to cure in uh, a natural way. Uh, it's a lot easier to go with some things like chemotherapy or um, try and move it, target it directly, which we can do through different areas and different regions of medicine, which have come out of different traditions. Um, I do think there's a lot of medicine that's being rediscovered on the more traditional side, whether it is from medieval texts like St. Hildegard's um, and from the work done by women, but also from various different cultures all around the world. There's uh, here in Canada, there's uh, being more attention paid to uh, the indigenous cultures and their traditional ways of healing um, and I know the same is true in a lot of other cultures as well so rediscovering that things that maybe weren't written down that were passed orally through different traditions and cultures um, but also looking at some older texts uh, definitely is is re rediscovering in a way some things that may be more effective but it's also um, being able to incorporate them with the modern uh, different approaches that we have that have been developed through maybe like traditionally Western uh, medicine for, for lack of a better word uh, Which, and presumably... more scientific kind of testing, clinical trials, that kind of approach. Which is where 2UU presumably was. Showing yeah, exactly. She's an excellent example. Her story of um, the discovery of artemisinin-based therapies, that is like the perfect example. Excellent. Has anyone else got any questions they'd like to um, ask? Uh, Chad, who um, talks about similar sort of things in his uh, podcast, um, mentions that a lot of professional societies often have resources on their website. The American yeah. Physical Society and the American Institute of Physics both have sections on history with a focus on contributions by women. Mm -hmm. um, great. Well, if no one else has any more questions, um, have you got any last words you'd like to say or should we wrap up? Um, yeah, I, I 
don't think I have much more to say. Oh, here we um, go. Sorry, there's one. There's one here that um, I missed. Sorry. Do you have any thoughts on what enabled the women you talked about today to be so successful in male-dominated fields? Um, I think there's a few different aspects. So some of the things that I mentioned, um, having support and education is huge. Um, Hypatia was uh, educated by in a whole wide variety of things uh, by her father. He really helped and supported her in pursuing the education. Uh, Ada Lovelace had her mother and uh, various friends, family friends, Charles Babbage, uh, and her husband who supported her and helped her get the education, connecting her with um, different people so that she could learn a higher level of mathematics and uh, be able to understand various different things that weren't uh, traditionally part of the education of a woman or like a lady. Um, so having the support of others, people encouraging girls and women to uh, pursue their interests. If you see um, like the sparks of like an interest in math or engineering or something when someone is young and encouraging that and um, giving them the ability to to really grow and foster that that is huge also i think part of it is um, being uh, stubborn uh, certainly historically with women i think you don't need it quite as much nowadays which is great but even um one of the the quotes that I included when speaking about Tu Yu Yu, she was described as a stubborn woman, a tough and stubborn woman. So that certainly helped um, women back historically to to kind of be like, no, you can't tell me to not study this, to not research this. And they just persisted and would do what they could with what they were given with, um, whether it was their position in society or their education. And um, they just kind of had that doggedness of wanting to, to pursue their, their interests. So that also, I think, helped let some of them be successful. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, on behalf of everybody. Um, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in and for, for watching. I really appreciate it.